everybody, welcome back to Pagan's Witch Corner. My name is Pagan, and I am joined by one of my favorite authors, who I have been a fan of for many years now, and that is Amy Blackthorne. She is the author of Sacred Smoke and but Blackthorne's Botanical Brews. I don't have the book right in front of me, but I'm hoping yeah. that's the right title. Cool. <laughs> and Blackthorne's Protection Magic, which is her newest title that is out. All amazing, wonderful books, such valuable information in all of them. And her newest book, I literally just finished it this morning. Fantastic book. So here's your sales pitch, everybody. Go buy a copy, any of the copies, <laughs> any of the books. They're totally worth it. But if you're looking for something that's definitely necessary, especially if you might be LGBTQIA or if you might be of the female persuasion, not saying that this excludes the men of the male persuasion, but saying those things, if you are those, the Protection Magic book is definitely a book I highly, highly, highly cannot recommend enough. Please go buy a copy. It has so much valuable information to keep you safe in the magical world and in the physical world. So please go check that out. It is a fantastic book. But anyway, enough about that. Amy, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. I couldn't decide if we were recording yet. <laughs> yes, we are recording. Get the <laughs> uh, we, we gushed a little bit before the recording uh, because I always do that with my guests just to get everybody comfortable. But, you know, the cool thing is you wrote such fantastic books. All of your books are so good. And they are literally jam-packed with such useful, amazing knowledge in them. But even just, you know, talking about this one right here that I've literally just got in front of me because the other two I have on my Kindle. Um, but this one is so good and literally has so much information in it to keep you safe in today's world. And like I'm sitting there reading it, I'm like, my daughter's not quite old enough to read this. She's almost like, how old should she be to read this? And I'm having this internal debate as I'm reading this book. And I'm like, I feel like she should read it now. But there's some themes in this that are a little adult. And yes. But at the same time, I'm like, she needs to read this because it's got so much information in it that is so valuable, especially to the crazy, scary world that we live in. And I don't want to, you know, undercut that we do live in a scary world. And right now it is very turbulent. And this is a book that is needed for today. So if that is something that you are looking for and you want to know more about this, please go pick up a copy. We're going to talk a little bit about it, but please pick up a copy because I promise you will not regret it. But today we're going to talk about protection magic. We're going to talk about something really cool that we gushed a little bit about before, which is using tarot cards as magic. And we're going to talk about working with some herbs. But for starters, what inspired you to write this book? The, the protection magic book it's <clears throat> i've spent so much of my grown-up adult life working in the world entrenched in the idea of physical security that magical security sort of grew out of that and they sort of fed each other as ideas and practices so there were neat things that i was able to implement from executive protection to into my magical properties and the, you know there's some definitely some magic that went into keeping me safe um, when dealing with security threats. Uh, as a matter of fact, <laughs> the, the one that really gets me as far as plants go was my neighborhood, my little flora and fauna in my yard uh, let me know that there was, a, there was an issue, there was a security threat. Mm -hmm. like, how, how did this happen? Um, every full moon or new moon, depending on what's going on, um, I'll, I'll beat the balance of the property and make sure everybody knows that this is a space. We're all good here. Everything's good. If you're not a friend of ours, you'll be leaving very shortly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and the, um, I got to the backyard and I was along one side of the fence and noticed a row of poke plants had creeped up along the fence just from nowhere. There's now poke plants of the size of my shoulder, the height of my shoulder. I'm like, okay, well, poke is poisonous yes so it makes a good protection plan if it can protect itself it can protect you it's behind the house and just outside the gate so what is it that I can't see that I need protection from mm -hmm. and so I started evaluating different areas of my life and you know where where was I going what was I doing you know what was what was this threat that I couldn't see and it turned out I had a stalker so I was able to um, really dig down and uh, deal with the threat that it possessed. And I honestly don't think that I'd be here 
if I hadn't gotten the heads up from Poke. Good for the poke notifying you, which is really funny because I have some I have poke that surrounds my backyard. And interestingly enough, when it came up, I was just like, I don't know what this is. And I went and researched what it was. And I was like, oh, well, you're poisonous. Don't kill my dogs, please. Don't let my dogs eat you. But you can stay if you're going to keep the property safe, which is very interesting. Otherwise, I was like, I will find a way to kill you if you you do this and interestingly enough my father-in-law came and chopped down all the poke last year uh -huh. and it all came back twice as vibrant this year of course and i'm did. like you were supposed to die apparently so apparently you have heeded my warning and you are here to actually serve a purpose which is cool and you know i live on a nice little farm that i would say that is in the middle of nowhere in the middle of a city which my farm is literally in the middle of a city but it, it's surrounded by all these crazy little like things like we've got poke and we've got honeysuckle and we've got blackberries that all just decided to randomly grow along my fence row but they never come in my yard they're just on the outside and i'm like well okay i mean i guess we're just gonna go ahead and keep a boundary outside which is fine <laughs> and interestingly enough part of my property belonged to one of my sister-in-laws and she sold it to some unsavory characters mm. and oh when you can say that plants have spirits i had always known this but it was very interesting when i had that kind of interesting thing happen was they decided to go cut down a bunch of trees that didn't actually need to be cut down and there were psychic screams coming out of the woods and i'm like um that's not normal <laughs> that's, that's not, not that's expected. not okay <laughs> what and then i go outside and i see what they're doing and i'm like it's not technically on my property i can't do anything about it and i basically went out that night and i told the land and i told the woods and all this and i said if you don't like them make them leave i can't stop them not legally but if you don't want them here make them leave and about two days later, we had a gentle rainstorm. And when I say a gentle rainstorm for Tennessee, it was misting. Like it wasn't even, there was no wind. It was just, you know, a little wet, a little damp outside. But this giant poplar tree that has been here for hundreds of years almost fell on the trailer that was back there that they were living in. And came about a foot away from crushing it. Oh, wow. And there was no wind. There was no, like, we went back there. This tree was alive. It was not dead. There was no way this tree could just uproot itself and fall over without a windstorm. It wasn't leaning. It was perfectly fine. Everything was good. And, you know, then I, you know, after they told me this happened, and then they said that some weird stuff was happening in their trailer and like, <laughs> other stuff was happening, I was like, I'm not going to ask who did it or what did it. I'm not involved. You guys get to do whatever you want, but I'm here for it. I, I'll just watch with popcorn. Good job, everybody. <laughs> and about a month later, they moved, they sold the property to my other sister-in-law and um, moved away. Nice. But it was really, really crazy how that worked out. Um, but yeah, I, I have to say that, you know, your story with the poke is very interesting that a lot of these plants have such animism to them and mm -hmm. such life and it's so cool uh, so cool the way that it actually worked out and i love some of the things that you talk about that with your book about all the properties especially in the gardening section of how you just are like hey i want this to grow here because i want it to protect me from x y and z or to bring me this you know beneficial luck which is so awesome so <laughs> what is your favorite and i know you probably have many but what's your favorite herb to grow? Oh my goodness. Um, Vitex agnus castus, a chaste tree. Okay. Um, for those of you who are familiar, they, they have this baby leaves and it looks like a particular herb that is illegal in most places. <laughs> uh, so those little handy leaves are gorgeous and beautiful. I'm, they're really amusing when uh, people haven't seen it before and they, they walk up to the property and they're like, oh, qua, like... Is that what I think? No, it's not what you think it is. <laughs> <laughs> but they do get big cones of beautiful purple flowers that mm -hmm. attract hummingbirds and butterflies and pollinators of all sorts. 
And so they get a nice stopover where they can hang out and refresh. Um, it's sacred to Hera. So the protection that it has afforded for certain areas of my life has been very beneficial and very thankful. Uh, but the neat thing is, it's actually a hormone modulator. The, it's got its name Chaste Tree because the monks would actually grow it in the inner area of their courtyard gardens um, because they're, the berries that it produces are spicy. So they, they call it monk's pepper. Mm -hmm. Much cheaper than trying to find actual pepper in medieval England. Uh, and so they, they harvest the, these fabulous, they're gray little hard seeds. Um, so they're not like a blackberry you're, you're thinking of. It's mm -hmm. a little hard, just like a peppercorn. And so they'd take these and they'd pepper their food with it. They'd, they'd take the very mild wood and use it to carve for their, um, the handles of their eating knives. It's just about featureless. It's a lot like holly. It's a blanched white wood. It's very smooth. It's easy to carve. It's soft enough to be carved and sturdy enough to be sturdy. Um, but what our gentlemen monks did not understand was the hormone modulating effects of chaste tree. You know, they thought it was the wood on their knives keeping them chaste for God. And no, they were, they were giving themselves estrogen poisoning. <laughs> Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> oh wow. Okay. Uh yeah. this is one of the benefits of also learning about all the plants that are in your yards and what you consume everyone because you never know what you're actually doing to your body. So yep. be careful with that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Oh, that is wild. That is too wild. I love that. Um, I'm poor monks, but still, that that's whoa. <laughs> that was not the expecting turn of that story. I was I was like, oh well, it's just making them infertile. That's what I was thinking. Nope. Nope. <laughs> Whoopsies. Oh, that's funny. Uh, but the cool thing is that I love that you are talking about your pollinators and stuff like that. And if, I am a huge hummingbird and pollinator fanatic. I grow lots and lots of uh, food for my hummingbirds and for my bees as well every year because, you know, you got to protect your pollinators because without them, right. we don't have a planet, people. Protect your <laughs> pollinators. Um, Do you get a lot of sphinx moths where you are? Yeah. I'm sorry. What was that? Sphinx moths. They look like hummingbirds. Oh, yeah, yeah, we do. Um, which is really funny because I thought that there was a hummingbird stuck in my window the other night. And it was actually one of those moths. And it, when I looked at it, I was like, oh, you're not actually a hummingbird. You're not what I want you to be. Please go away. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we, we actually get a lot of really interesting moths and all that. Which, they, you know, I... I don't want to always subscribe to a lot of the Appalachian uh, folklore that's associated with some moths and stuff like that mm -hmm. because they're really big lunar moths. I say if you get like one stuck in your screen or something, like that, it's a death omen. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, mm, I'm I'm just gonna say no because that's happened before. And I'm like, I'm we're nope. I don't know that fact. Nope, 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 nope. <laughs> we're not. I'm gonna pretend like that doesn't exist. Um, uh, which luckily nobody died at my house. But uh, it, it was very interesting that when I read that, I was like, hmm. I know it's folklore, but I'm just going to say no because I don't want that to be real. <laughs> I don't want anybody to, buy, to die in my house. Thank you. Because <laughs> uh, they usually say it's supposed to represent like a spirit coming to like take somebody to the afterlife mm -hmm. um, that's supposed to die within a couple of days of you seeing the moth and all that. So I'm like, hmm, okay, no, thank you. No, 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 that's not going to happen. Uh, but yes, I, I, we have... Uh, three hummingbird feeders out front and then I have four more in my backyard plus all of our plants and all that for our hummingbirds and we have uh five beehives as well nice yeah we we love our pollinators uh which one of them actually got stuck on a uh, aphid trap and I was like no let me save you if I can I don't know if it it lived or died but I was like here let me save you screw the aphids but let me save you <laughs> <laughs> aphids are the devil oh gosh yes I hate them we get them every year and I hate them they're, they're awful. Um, but kind of segueing back a little bit to your book, uh, you put some really valuable information in there in that the physical section alone, which I remember when I first opened the book, I was like, this is telling me how to break out of handcuffs. What? What book is this? <laughs> <laughs> and it was just, I was like, 
what? And I flipped through a few pages and I was like, I'm going to have to read this book carefully. I don't know if I'm going to jive with this. What did she write? And my husband's like, what are you reading? And I explained to him what I was reading. And he was like, that's in a magic book? He's like, what? I'm confused. <laughs> Long story short for everybody who's listening, there is a whole section in her protection book that talks about physical protections and what you can do to protect yourself, especially if you end up being kidnapped. There, there was a whole section in there about that, which was surprising to me, but it was really interesting. And I'm really thankful that you put it in there because I think it's something that we in the magic community especially don't talk about enough. And that is our physical protections. Absolutely. It, there's one to the exclusion of the other. And it's like, I, I appreciate that you want to make sure that you're sound physically, but your spiritual protection means nothing if your physical body isn't your own. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. It's, it's so hard to sort of regulate both of those ideas in a lot of communities, which is why it was so important to me to put it in there. Um, I know my, my publisher went back and forth, like, do we, do we want, does this belong? Does this really like, are we needing that? And so far the feedback has been overwhelmingly positive that people have needed this. They just, they knew they needed this, but they didn't know where to go and find it. Mm -hmm. So the fact that I'm presenting it in a book that tells them like, Hey, this is, this is for your benefit. It's something that more people are understanding that they needed it and they had no idea. Yes. You don't know what you don't know. Yes, absolutely. And you know, it, we do live in a scary world, especially um, anybody who is of the BIPOC community or even the LGBTQ community, or even if you just happen to be female presenting, it's scary for us. And I'm not saying that men don't have issues. Please don't, my audience, please don't think that because you guys have just as many issues as we do. But in a lot of ways, sometimes it's a little bit easier for you. And so I think that having a book in our community and you know there are things that happen even in pagan communities you know a lot of people think pagan communities are the safe communities we try to be but there's still things that happen and mm -hmm. having the not only fit the spiritual connection to protect yourself but also having that physical protection is something that definitely needs to be a conversation on i think everybody's tongue at least once during my practice to make sure that you're physically safe as well as mentally and spiritually. I think that's why it was so important to make sure that the ethics discussion was at the very beginning of the book so that you have an idea of how you feel about this topic, this topic, this topic, this topic, before you go into developing your protection plan for yourself and for your family, because then you know where you want those boundaries to be. If you, if your boundary is Texas, like I'm not going to do X, like someone, so-and-so can do Y, but I'm steadfast in my belief that that's not okay. Knowing that before you go in makes it so much easier for you to build that protection plan because you know where you want to end up and how you're willing to get there as a, uh, as an ethical practitioner. Mm -hmm. And it's, everyone's ethics are so very nuanced and their own that you can't just assume that so-and-so feels this way about this thing because they're, they call themselves a witch, can't assume anything. So going through that checklist and understanding how you feel about individual things is going to give you a leg up when you're trying to go through and say, okay, what is important to me? What is important to make sure my family is okay? Where do I draw those lines? Yes, I think that is very important. And one of the things I really did also really very much enjoy and you see this a lot i don't know if you're on tiktok but you do see this a lot on tiktok with um the witchcraft communities where a lot of people say oh i have a curse and you put this beautiful little checklist and then it's like do you have a curse or do you have bad luck or are you just jinxed did you do it to yourself and you have this really <laughs> great kind of way to figure it out which i think is something that we also don't talk about enough you know we talk about oh yes curses are a thing and hexes happen and you know people do this to you and but jinxes are something we also don't talk a lot about and you know just run-of-the-mill bad luck and it, how it can look a little bit like a curse so i'm very thankful that you also put that in the book the really great thing that i also enjoyed was that you really did outline what it looks like for a witch to know yourself to know what your practice should look like what you should be expecting and what your own magic is and that your magic is not going to be the same as everybody else's 
And I loved what you said about the Wiccan Reed, that the fact of the matter was that, yes, you can be a Wiccan, you can follow the Reed, but no matter what you do, you're still going to be harming something somewhere. You can't live by literally not harming ever. Because if you eat food, you've harmed something. You've harmed a plant. You've harmed an animal. You've harmed something in the process to get your food. But at the same time, we have to really differentiate of the... I, I love the Wiccan read that I've heard so many times is, do no harm, but take no shit. <laughs> Absolutely. We, when we look inside ourselves and try and figure out who we are, there's got to be this clear delineation of what is acceptable and what isn't. And if you try and live your life to be a good person and, and help the people around you, that's fantastic. There's, there's no issue there. But making sure that you pat yourself on the back because you weren't actively being a jerk to somebody today, like that, that's the base, the, the bar is so low, it's in the basement. Let's, <laughs> yeah. let's. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, but if you're having to pat yourself on for being a good human, you might want to reevaluate your priorities just a little bit. Yeah. In the world we live in, it, being a good human is the standard. You shouldn't be patting yourself on it, the back for it. You should yeah. just be a good human. And we've talked about that many times on this show. So please be good humans, everyone. But, you know, I love that you put that in there. And I love that, you know, you did all this great stuff. You, like, guys, I'm going to talk about how great this book is forever because it really was that good. <laughs> but it... The one thing I really did get giddy about was the fact that your mention of tarot work as magic. And I want you to tell me all about that and talk to a little bit about that. Like, this is a revolutionally crazy concept to me. Like, obviously, like, my brain was like, I knew that you could do this. But nobody's ever explained to me how to do this until your book so let's talk about using tarot as magic for starters why did you put it in the book oh it's so easy <laughs> <laughs> when we look at uh, cards for symbolism when we're that symbolism speaks to us for divination we lay out a bunch of cards mm -hmm. and my friend says oh my 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 boyfriend's cheating what should i do how should i handle this you know, we, we look into those symbols and take them into our, our subconscious to help our friends, family, clients, whoever, see where they're supposed to go. Mm -hmm. But it's so easy to just take that next step and take the symbolism that is bringing us all this information and use it as a two-way street. We're now sending out this information to the universe saying, I want to protect myself. I want to use this stuff. The easiest way I can explain it to you, fabulous humans at home, is treat your tarot deck as a as a math problem i want justice so that justice is our is our end result mm -hmm. x plus y equals justice so what cards to you mean justice we, we're going to take these two cards and put them together and out pops justice we're giving our we'll say candle magic just because it's an easy example a nuanced flavor of how that should look like instead of just carving justice on a candle which is perfectly fine um, you're actually giving it sort of a, a direction to go okay we're, so we're talking about direction so maybe the chariot we're getting their stuff together everybody's going in the same direction okay chariot plus what equals justice queen of swords that's the, Ooh, first like thing, it. that's the first thing that comes to my mind is queen of swords because yes. queen of swords is one of those ones where she will shank a bitch. She will. Yes. And I love her for it. She she is just that she reminds me of the Morgan. She just exudes power. And I love it. Oh, <laughs> I love it so much. Anyway, she she's my tarot crush. So moving on. <laughs> uh I did an interview once for a tarot blog probably 10 years ago. And the the author of this tarot blog uh, dubbed me the Queen of Swords because the picture that I sent her for promo was me doing a sword swallowing. So this oh, actually wow all goes together <laughs> well i mean i i have to say that you definitely exude some queen of swords energy especially after reading your books and you know knowing your a little bit about your history with the fact that you are a black belt and that you have um you're a firearms expert 
I would say. I, I think it was firearms sector is yep. how you put it. And you've taught firearms classes and self defense and all this other cool stuff and work security and girl, you're just a badass. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> I was the I was the bodyguard for the CFO of a thirty million dollar company. Oh wow. Okay. And yeah, it was it was definitely a thing. So it presented its own set of structures and potential pitfalls that other security professionals might not have encountered Mm -hmm. because we have a big pagan community there people are everywhere and it's usually not in the place that you think you'd find someone so it's really interesting to have to field questions um, about religious ethics while you're trying to keep someone from getting your boss kicked in the face (laughs) it's yeah it's definitely interesting that would definitely qualify for an interesting day in the office. <laughs> <laughs> to be like, can you tell me about the goddess today? And be like, hold on, I have to stop this guy. I'll answer your question in a moment. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's very interesting. But yeah, I, I think that a lot of times with magical tools, I think sometimes we put them in a box um, mentally that they can only do one thing. And that's the only thing that they're allowed to do. But I think a lot of times, specifically thinking about like tarot and even other forms of divination, um, you know, we see this a lot, like the crossover between runes and uh, magic, but using tarot and specifically the image or the tarot card, there was a lot of references where you would be like, just go find an old deck or something at a flea market and use that card and write your intentions on the card and put it in your spell. And it's like, huh, I have like 80 tarot (laughs) decks now. And like half of them are just sitting on my shelf doing it. Hmm. You guys might be working your way into a spell now. <laughs> nice. <laughs> yeah, I've got the Deviant Moon, which, which is one of my favorites. Um, I honest to goodness, I've got the first edition. I've got the border list. I've got the digital app for your phone. It's it's a it's a problem, <laughs> but it's such a great deck, um, especially for diagnosing magical ailments, oh, because yeah. it's a okay. dark, gritty, um, sort of fantastical deck. There's it's like. If Bosch and Lewis Carroll came up together with a tarot deck, like that's what it would look like. And so you can see things depicted in the card, like soul theft and hexes and curses. And you can see where they're um, coming at, who's influencing what. And there's figures. They're not really humans. Um, they're not people. They're, they're different figures in the cards. And my favorite way to do that is that to actually take the cards that are speaking the loudest and look who they're looking at which card are they looking at in this spread? And it, it gives you an extra, I'm getting goosebumps. It gets you an extra layer of interesting um, understanding, like ways to sort of take apart what's happening in a particular situation that we would have never seen if not mm-hmm. for this card, looking at that card. Um, so they all have different jobs. So the spacious tarot I found when I was writing protection magic. So I was going through the tarot section tarot chapter I actually I liked it enough that I did a similar thing in the um Black Thorns Botanical Wellness that comes out at Salon oh. um so I was I would say um tarot major arcana death card and just scroll through the images of what these different decks all look like well I found the spacious tarot because um you know the in the writer weight smith We've got the rider and the, this very stark figure and he's mm-hmm. got this flag and he's riding through the, the people throwing themselves at him. Oh, the spacious flips the viewpoint around so you can see what the main characters in those spaces are looking at. So you get these wide open spaces with very interesting viewpoints. Well, the death card is the only one that I found that really didn't. Instead, you see this um, desert ground, and instead of the the flag with the Tudor rose on it, it's just a like a pentacle um, mm-hmm. laying with the Tudor rose on it. And this bony hand is reaching for that Tudor rose, but it's been there so long that ivy has started to grow up around the bones and the hand, and it's just perfection. Wow, that sounds. It's, and that's the the spacious tarot deck. Yes. Okay, uh, and the, the other one is tarot deviant is on, moon, right? Yes, uh, thespaciousterrow.com. This is the uh, second edition from 2020. Uh, but yeah, I just, I love them so much. There's a 
there's an additional oracle from the same artist who did uh, the Deviant Moon. The it's a a Lenormand deck, mm-hmm. and there's fan, just fantastic Garden of Lucid Daydreams, and so you get individual cards that depict just Lenormand scenes, individual flowers, hands, seeds, figures, and they're so very. There's a lot of depth there. Yes. It sounds like there's a lot of depth with these cards. And, you know, you're kind of describing, um, especially the spacious deck. It reminds me of an Oracle deck that I have that's called the Dark Mirror deck. Ooh. And the guidebook is worthless. I will be honest with you. It is absolutely, it is, this deck was meant for you to learn how to read it intuitively. The guidebook is, just throw the guidebook out if you guys go buy the deck. Just honestly, you don't need it. Um, if you're wanting to learn how to read based off of imagery and intuitively this is a great deck for you to do that but it is dark it is not a deck that i i say it's one of my deck that will bite you so if you want a reading with it it's going to bite you it's not going to tell you something nice it's going to bite you in the process um and it bites everybody so (laughs) it, it doesn't differentiate it bites everybody uh but it does it will tell you the nittiest grittiest most honest truth that you need to hear and I remember a reading, I had a friend um, come to me and she was like, hey, I'm pretty sure that my boyfriend is cheating on me. And I'm like, okay. And she's like, I don't think he's being honest with me. And I'm like, okay. And I was like, what deck do you want? She's like, give me your mean one. Just, I, I need a brutally honest answer. And I'm like, okay, you asked for it. Just letting you know. And so I <laughs> shuffle this deck and immediately it pulls out a card that uh, talks about they are not who they say they are. And I'm like, oh, shit. Okay. And then there was another one that basically talked about being, you know, that seemed like the the person and it was being very unfaithful. I don't even remember the, the actual card off the top of my head, but I do remember the reading. And it did say, it was like, this is, they're not being who they are. They're saying one thing to you, but they are not, that's not them. And they are not being faithful to you. They are telling you lies and all this other stuff. And she's like, well, shit. And about a month later, the whole thing blew up. Nice publicly oh, and no. like the whole thing came out and i'm like oh you should have listened to me when i told you to get out oh okay i'm sorry the deck was right <laughs> and it is definitely one of those decks that like you were saying that will give you that spiritual kind of ailment kind of diagnosis as well and it'll tell you hey basically you've got some juju you need to deal with or you've got this that you need to deal with or there's something that's not right here it is a mean deck. It's a gorgeous deck, but it is a mean deck. <laughs> it is very I, mean. <laughs> I got the Wild Unknown for my birthday. Oh, I love a that few deck. Years ago. Oh, it's one of my favorites. It kicks me square in the teeth every time. <laughs> oh yeah, it's mean too. It, it is definitely mean. <laughs> I, I'd say probably my most favorite recent um, Oracle deck that I, I am just in love with is, I believe it's Into the Lonely Woods by Lucy Cavendish. Um, it reminds, I like her stuff. Oh yeah, her stuff is gorgeous. I have two of her other decks as well, uh, which one of them was my first Oracle deck. And, Oracle Tarot? Yeah. Uh, no, it was uh, Oracle of the Shapeshifters. Oh, I haven't seen that one. Gorgeous I, deck. My, gorgeous deck. I love Lucy's work. Oh, um, yes. I have, I have her. I have the three or four copies of the Oracle Tarot, and I have used this uh, for reading with clients, especially new clients, mm-hmm. who are probably. I think I got it in 2007 or 2008. Um, the shop where I was reading uh, Mystical Voyage, the owner, that was the deck that she used and I hadn't seen it before. So I was like, oh, hey, I'll give this a shot. And it's so chill. If you're if the cards in any way make you anxious, like this is the deck to go with because yep. they take the scary cards and they rename them. They, they do their own thing. So instead of the devil, it's bondage. Instead of death, it just says change. It's oh. so much more. The watercolors are nice. It's very reassuring. There's no scary tarot card that's going to have somebody, oh my God, it's going to. It's very gentle. So I I'm, found this on the web. <laughs> my, apparently, my watch wants to participate Appa- in the apparently, in well. <laughs> <laughs> apparently, the technology wants to also say hello. Hello, technology. <laughs> um, but yeah, the, the deck I was talking about, it reminds me of uh, where the wild things are. If you remember that oh, book yes. as a child, it, the artwork looks just like it. And it is a spot on deck, spot, spot on deck. 
Um, one of my favorite things to do with it is to sit down with my guides and deities and be like, I'm going to ask a series of questions. And each question that I ask, just give me a card to do it. If the card doesn't make sense, I will know you didn't answer the question and just put them in order. And it worked. That deck works famously perfect for that. So great, great deck. While we're on the topic of Oracle and Tarot, do you have a deck that you like to use for offering healing information to people? I do. I sh- I'm actually holding it. Oh, wow. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's called it's called the Illist Tarot, and it's not ill in the sickly way. It's ill in the late '90s vernacular of awesome and cool. Mm-hmm. It is. It is a late '90s, early 2000s. It's all celebrities. <laughs> okay. I'm, I should you not. <laughs> it actually works really well. Oh, that um, sounds fun. That sounds like a fun deck. So the chariot is Janet Jackson. <laughs> wow, that fits perfectly. Uh, <laughs> the Queen of Swords is Shannon Doherty. Okay, yeah, that fits well. Uh, do, 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 do. Oh, Drew Barrymore is the sun. That also fits really well. Wow, they did a good job. Like They did a really people. good job with these. Um, let's see. Oh, who is that? That's, um... oh, I know her name. Let's go for somebody else that I know. Oh, Oprah is the King of Pentacles. That also fits really well. Wow, <laughs> that that's a that sounds like a great deck to definitely have some interesting energy, especially you know. And somebody I, I've had this conversation with a few people, um, you know, kind of in my coven circle as well. What are your thoughts on celebrities becoming our new deities of essentially tomorrow? That's it's a great. Um, topic for discussion because there's when we talk about the egregore and the the advancement of energy and thought forms there's the individual idea of oh I'm, i've created a servitor and and i'm charging them with this job and we're they're, we're going to work together and that'll be great and then there's the overarching things that actually elevate above thought forms to now achieve reality Mm -hmm. so like when my my niece was eight years old and she came to me and she said amy i know you won't lie to me um mommy and daddy they think i I don't know these things um so is santa claus real and i said since we're gonna talk you came to me like a like a grown-up and you're like asking these questions then you deserve the answer Mm -hmm. i said the answer is yes i said but let me explain why it's a yes um so you don't think that i'm just pulling your leg when we looked at who this being originally was, you know, there may have been a St. Nicholas, who's actually the, the patron saint of sex workers. Mm-hmm. Bless him. Um, the ideas that we come across, these former people, these, these, it elevates them to this point of close to godhood because enough people over enough time have created a belief of this person existing even if he didn't exist before, we've now created him in the, you know, in the image of this 30s Coca-Cola fat jolly guy, <laughs> yes. you know, even if he didn't exist before, he does now because so many people have put so much faith, effort, and belief into this idea that it has now spontaneously been created. Yes, I would say that is very accurate. And it's funny that you bring up Santa Claus. Um, I, I believe it was not this last year, but the year before, um, I attended a seance, um, a virtual seance where they wanted to contact Santa Claus. Mm -hmm. And they contacted what I would say is the archetype of Santa. I don't know if they officially contacted Santa, but Santa was all about, you know, had, there was like sounds of like hoofbeats on people's roofs and like people heard knocking on their windows. And, Santa was this really nice kind of guy, but his favorite thing was love dangerously. And he's also apparently friends with Bigfoot. Nice. Um, Which, you know, we're like, you know, maybe he picks up Bigfoot and goes and delivers presents together. I don't know. But that would be cool. cool. That would be cool. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, we all know Bigfoot's really good at throwing tree branches. So maybe he uses Bigfoot to throw the presents down from the you know sleigh i don't know how it works but apparently santa and bigfoot are friends but his cool thing was that he was he said love dangerously and i'll always remember that because of the fact that i don't think that we 
I think we love carefully because a Mm -hmm. lot of humans don't want to get hurt, especially when it comes to love. And I think that if we love dangerously more often than not, we would experience the world in such a wonderful way. And that was kind of his whole like point to his message. And he kind of went a little bit further than that. But it was really interesting the way that he said that. And I was like, you know what? I'm never going to forget that. Love dangerously. That is, am- and and he also said, love dangerously and wear it as a talisman. Nice. And I'm like, okay, Santa, I didn't really believe in you before, but you've got my vote now. Okay. <laughs> Apparently you're in the belief column, which is cool. Um, But, you know, I think that that is definitely something that we should do. But I think also wearing love as a talisman, especially in today's world where we see so much hate mm-hmm. and so much just ugly ugly nastiness that we see in this world today loving dangerously and wearing it as a talisman is such a profound message even into the i gosh i want to say the sands was like two years ago but you know with the pandemic everything blurs together (laughs) yes um but you know i think that if we do that we're going to have such a much stronger impact on our world and you know I would say that it goes hand in hand with what you wrote in your book. Your book is all about being safe and being careful, but it's also about living your magic to its fullest in its own way, which is so cool. So, so cool. You did such a good job with it. And I'm, I'm going to gush about it because it, it really was just a great book. I got done and I was like, oh, it's done. Oh, there's no more. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've had a surprising... <laughs> I've had a surprising number of people say I finished the book and then I flipped to the beginning and started it again. Mm -hmm. And that's not something I expected, which makes me very happy. Yeah, it's very, very well done. It was just a really great book. And most books, especially most um, witchcraft books, I usually will read them cover to cover. And then um, because a lot of them do have like journaling exercises or work that needs to be done within it. Mm -hmm. And then I will go back through and actually do the work in it. So now it's time for me to go back through and do the work in it because I will have to read it again cover to cover uh, because I have read it now. And if I don't do it, if I try to do it where I work through it at the same time, I'll never get through the book. (laughs) Yeah, I'll stop halfway through. I'll get distracted because that's what I do being neurodivergent and and, um you know that will just never happen so reading it through cover to cover helps me absorb some of it and then i can go back through and be like oh hey this didn't really apply to me when i read through it but i'm gonna check it out now and see if it still doesn't apply if not then i'll move on to the next section which is a really great idea uh so anybody who's out there if that's what you want to do that you're really adamant you want to work through a book read it cover to cover first and then go back through because you may never get through it otherwise yeah, and now you can go and play with duct tape. And yes, play here. with duct tape. Oh, that was fun. I was like, you know, I like duct tape. Duct tape's cool. And I like what you, oh, the section that you wrote about creating the duct tape wallets. And I'm like, wow, that takes me back to high school. <laughs> oh, yeah. Because I had a duct tape wallet in high school that a friend made me. And this friend went on to become this fashion designer and made this whole line of like duct tape belts. She made a duct tape the uh, prom dress for her prom nice. that year she was a badass too i love badass women they're so awesome um but yeah she she made a duct tape prom dress which was so cool and i never would have thought about doing what you did to have that you know extra wallet to just be like here you can have that one <laughs> there's nothing in it <laughs> run away <laughs> so it was literally me reading it i'm like throw the wallet and run away as fast as you can <laughs> um which, absolutely if you guys probably are like what on earth are you guys talking about read the book i promise <laughs> it'll make sense the whole thing with duct tape and then you'll go buy like five rolls of duct tape to understand why we're talking about making duct tape wallets because it makes sense so we are almost close to time, so I want to go ahead and have you talk about your books that you've got out, how, where people can find you, and any upcoming projects that you have, whether it be conferences, new books, new projects, whatever it may be. Uh, tell the people all about yourself and where they can find you and all your good stuff. Fantastic. So the first thing I'm going to tell you is go check out amyblackthorn.com because there's the first 30 pages of each of my books is available right there. You can download it, have it forever. I want you to know that this is something you need in your life before you buy it because money is a very fragile thing, especially right now. So go download the first 30 pages and figure out what goes in on your brain. Because the first book is Blackthorn's Botanical Magic. That is, it's an encyclopedia of 
magic with essential oils and aromatherapy. Mm -hmm. Really fantastic. Um, lots of candle magic, easy to do stuff that comes together in a moment. Uh, the second is sacred smoke. It is creating your own uh, practice first, uh, around creating those scented smokes that relies on your own experience rather than um, appropriating someone else's culture. Mm -hmm. So it talks about where these plants are, how to find them, what they're, what they smell like, what they don't, you know, they're maybe very potent magic, but they smell awful like jasmine. <laughs> yeah, jasmine smells like ass. Sorry, anybody burning, out there that likes jasmine, but no thanks. You, burning you jasmine flowers smells like cat pee. <laughs> don't burn jasmine flowers ever. Oh, yeah, no, no, no. I don't like the way they smell of not being burned. <laughs> yeah, it's just, it's just bad. Yeah. Um, we, the next one is Blackthorn's Botanical Brews. So that's creating magic with um, syrups and creating our own magical teas, um, stuff in the kitchen, stuff in the bar, um, magic with just plain fruit. Um, and magic as a magical ingredient in your materials. So you can create soda flavors, you know, just other things they have in your house that may be getting to go bad anyway. So there, this is a great way to extend the life of the stuff that you're producing and, and stretch your budget a little bit more because it's a lot cheaper to buy a little bit of seltzer water than it is a case of soda. So um, strawberry and watermelon sodas are my favorite. <laughs> that is true. That is very true. Uh, I, I'm all about preserving all of your stuff the best you possibly can and um, penny punching if you need to. Um, and then next in, Oct in Oct October 31st at Samhain, we have Blackthorn's Botanical Wellness is being released. So this is a, uh, it's a wellness focused book, but in going through the recipes and the research and all the stuff that I wanted to produce and bring to this project, not a single one of them discusses chronic illness, chronic pain, um, and some of the things that we deal with in our witchy communities by being people who are dealing with chronic pain, mm -hmm. things like, oh, what did you do to deserve, you know, getting a broken leg or getting run over by a truck or, you know, getting hives like this is this is leftover dominionist stuff. And we need to push it out of our communities because this is this is not OK to blame people for getting sick. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so there is a chapter on. Um, self-care and wellness meditations through the tarot so there's some really fun exercises in there too i'm actually going we're talking about creating and embodying thought forms in our ritual tools to help with daily care tasks to help with um, chronic illness to, to help you further your wellness journey um through yourself because if it was as easy as having a glass of mead and a bubble bath like we'd have done that already yep yeah. <laughs> I would have done that like 15 years ago when I got diagnosed with MS. No, thank you. No, yep. I, you, give me a practical thing, please. Something that actually cures so, it. <laughs> we're actually breaking down those blocks of the things that we think in our communities and that we are understanding now how harmful this is mm -hmm. to tell people that, you know, your, your chronic illness or your, your uh, chronic pain makes you less of a witch, that you can't practice magic if you're on medication. Like all of these things are crap and we need to make sure that we sort of tease that apart and pull it out into the daylight so people can see what it is yes. because they're not going to think of it about it abstractly. We need to just put it in black and white. This, the, the stuff is barely harmful to people. Mm -hmm. Let's not do that anymore. So it's, I, I'm really excited for this release. And again, that comes out on November 1st. It's available for pre-order now. So feel free to check in with your favorite booksellers. Um, and it's, it's so crazy. The, the major retailers in the world that people go for things mm -hmm. every day carry my books this is it's scary <laughs> so, somebody po uh, posted my um botanical magic on walmart.com and target i'm like how are my books on target's <laughs> website this is, does not make sense so yeah check out amyblackthorn.com uh to get all the different books that i have right now if you want autographed copies for your collection. You can get those from my tea shop, blackthornsbotanicals.com. And there's a link on amyblackthorn.com. So you can do all the places. And I'm just so tickled to hang out with you. This was, this was a great time. This was an awesome time. And when your book actually comes out this fall, you're going to have to come back by. You're going to have to promote it. We're going to have to talk all about it because obviously I love your books. I own three of them. I didn't realize there was one that I was missing. So I'm going to have to go buy that later. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, I, I'm, 
I am so excited to hear about this one because that one is going to be near and dear to my heart because I have multiple sclerosis. So uh, I definitely understand all the things that you talked about and a lot of the ableism that does come out of being in the pagan community sometimes because sometimes it's like, here, just take this oil or take this thing and you'll be fine. Ladies, okay. gentlemen, I've already done all of that and then some and none of it worked. So yeah. I'm going to keep on practicing anyway. And my gods know that I'm forgetful and that some days I just don't feel like it. So I, <laughs> <laughs> they know that I don't keep to a regular schedule. That's how that works. Um, as always, thank you so much, Amy. This was so amazing. This was such this a just wonderful made my whole week. <laughs> This was just such a great conversation and such a great time. Thank you again for writing all the books that you do because Heck yeah. without you, we wouldn't know some of this amazing information. But to our audience... You guys are awesome. You guys are amazing. Take care of yourselves. Be kind to each other. Be kind to yourselves and be good to yourselves. And we will talk to you all very, very soon. I will see you all next week, hopefully, as long as God's willing. Um, sorry that this episode is coming to you a little bit late because last week I didn't get one out because my son graduated high school. I'm officially old. So uh, <laughs> that how that worked. But you guys take care of yourselves. Be kind to each other. And thank you so much. This was awesome. And we'll talk to you all soon. Bye, everybody. Bye.